Welcome to Unit 5, Lab 1. Today we will be doing the 16th episode of our Students Teach Snap series, and we will be covering search algorithms. Uh, in As part of the Unit 5, Lab 1 BJC curriculum. So let's check out the website first. So when you open up BJC's website, the first thing they have you do is they make you revisit the guess of my number lab that you did uh, in unit 2 lab 2. Now they just want you to click on it and load this file. They want you to play a few times. They want you to develop a strategy and then write the strategy down. And then right after that they want you to make the computer guess your number using this strategy. Now this whole page seems very very simple but in reality it will take you longer. Let's begin. So, when we open this up, right, um, we're literally just given number guessing game, a bunch of blocks inside, and some text up here, some sprites. So, I think the first thing we should do is we should attach a when start clicked into number guessing game. So, Let's say that um, the computer is thinking of a number from 1 to 60, and you want to guess the number. Let's say it's like 33. It's too high, right? So let's say 23. Too low, say 27. Correct. Okay. I got lucky. I got in 3. Now, sometimes I can get in 10, sometimes I can get in 9 if I do it this way. So. The best strategy, actually, is you always guess halfway in between the limits. So let's do this again. Let's say, you know, our limits are 1 and 60, 1 being the minimum and 60 being the maximum, right? And let's say our hidden number is 12, just as an example. The quickest way to find it would be to guess halfway between 1 and 60, right, which is 30. From there, the computer will tell us if we're too high or too low. If we're too high, we would guess halfway between... 1 to 30, which is 15. If we're too low, we would guess halfway between 30 to 60, which is 45. This cycle would continue until we find the hidden number. And it would take at most 6 tries on average, if mathematically speaking. So let's try it again. Let's guess 30. 30 is too low. Now, what do we guess if it's too low? 45. 45 is too high. Now we would guess halfway between 30 and 45. Now that would be what, 15 over two, which is seven and a half. Now it really depends where we guess here. Let's say 38. 38 is too low, which means now we know that our number is between 38 and 45. Now we got to look again, that's a seven, so that's three and a half. So we can do, let's say 42, 42 is too low. So we know it's between 42 and 45, right? So let's say 43, and it was 43. So I guess in roughly five guesses. Now, uh, if I guessed 44 here, same thing would have happened. Would have gotten it uh, in six. So, but generally that's our strategy is to guess uh, by half every time. Now to code, this activity where it wants us to develop a strategy that will identify the secret number and no more than six guesses to code it to code this part of the activity where the um, computer guesses your number what we need to do is we first need to make global variables this is the first thing you should always do when coding global variables are great because that's this how you can say organized so to make global variables, it's pretty easy. Go to variables, right? Let's uncheck this for now, right? Let's make let's make a variable and let's call it guess underscore number. That's our variable. And let's check it from here. Now, what we want to do is let's remove all the variables that they have given us for now, all right? So let's delete a variable. Let's delete guesses, and uh, let's make two new variables as well while we're here max and min now these will these variables will be the boundaries right of our number 
because uh, of our guessing range. Let's say we want we started with one to sixty, but let's say we want to do one to twenty, or then we want to thirty, right? Or you know, so from there we need these boundaries, right? Next, what we want to do is we want to show out show all of these sprites, right? Too small, just right, too big, because we're given it, right? So to do that, we simply get the show block and we drag the show block to each sprite. Right. Okay. Now, the main sprite, our little arrow right here, what we can do is we can hide them for now. And um, we can remove this label. This label I'm thinking of. No one really needs that right now. All right. All right. Uh, this is just our initial setup. Now, first, first thing that I'm going to do here is I'm going to set up the max, min, block, and the variables. So let's set up. Uh, we have the variables, the max and the min. So let's set up the blocks. So let's go to mo. Uh, let's go to motion for now. We're sensing, right? Make a block. Now the point of this block. The entire point of this block is so that we can initialize the maxes and mins in the very beginning. We can ask the user, what do you want the max to be and what do you want the min to be? And from there, we can uh, initialize those maxes and mins. So the first thing, obviously, we're going to ask the user, what do what you want your uh, max to be? So to keep it simple in this activity, right, we'll say the min is one. What max limit would you like? And obviously, we use a set block here. You guys are new to this. The set. We can use it twice, and you can say set the min to one as always, and set the max to whatever the answer is. Boom. Then we got our max min block. Perfect. Now we want to make the main computer guessing game block. Now that we got max and the mins initialized, like the main guessing infrastructure that the computer will be using. Now, right now, we can unselect this. We don't really need this. We're not going to be really using this. We're going to make everything from scratch. So let's make our, our block. Let's go. Uh, let's do control. So we go to control, and we're going to make computer underscore guessing underscore game. And for now that we're in computer guessing game. Right, obviously, we want to put in a show, just in case, right, I don't want anything to be hidden, and we want to be, make the sprite say, I will guess your secret number, for three seconds, okay, and then we will make another block inside this block, and this will be our guess maker, so this is our overarching block, and this is our um, actual algorithm on how to guess right now guess maker right we obviously we want to set we want to use set we want to use say and I think we're gonna need some operators but let's let's give it a second so this is how our algorithm actually worked right we would Add the min and the max, essentially, right? And we would divide it by two, right? But we had a slight rounding issue because sometimes it would be the, we would be dividing an odd number by two, right? And so to take care of that, it is an easy fix, right? So first off, we want to set our, our guess number variable. That will be what number the computer is guessing, right? Pretty simple. Now then, with that, we obviously we want to round function. And we want an addition function. And then as all, also we want our actual max and min variables because that, that's literally why we made them. Now what we're doing is we're adding their min and we're adding our max, right? Whatever that is. And we're dividing them by two. So 
So 1 plus 60, 61 divided by 2, 30.5, roughly 30, right? In this instance, we'll be using round. So we get that 31. This is really a simplified way of doing it. Now in snap, rounding down is a little tricky. So we'll just be rounding using the round function to help us with that. Right, so res of right now we don't the program didn't set min and minimax, so it's just gonna say zero, right? But basically you'd be setting guess number to this value. And afterwards, right, the computer is gonna say, Hey, is your number blah blah blah? Right? So for that we obviously we're gonna need the join function. Is your number and we're gonna need the actual variable for guess number. Is your number guess number? Question mark. Let's say for five seconds, right? Because we want to be able to read it. And then it is good to throw in a wait here so that nothing else uh, gets interrupted, right? And then finally, we put the guess maker inside of this program, right? The computer guessing game, this is going to be our main block of code, right? And everything afterwards will be based on broadcast functions. So we've made the actual main algorithm. Now we just have to tell the algorithm and the computer that when we click too small, when we click just right or too big, that our sprites know what to do, right? So when I click too small, we want it to broadcast, hey, too small has been clicked. It is too small. Guess higher, guess lower, ATC, right? So that's pretty easy, right? So we're gonna go just too small, right? They say when I am clicked, we will broadcast too small. That's it. It's that simple. When I am clicked, we will broadcast just right. When I'm clicked, we will broadcast too big. Nice. And we want to do it all here. When I receive, so the broadcast function works in that sense. You broadcast out a message and then another sprite can receive that message. So when I receive too, too small, when I receive just right, and when I receive too big, we're going to do something, right? So when I receive too small or too big, right? I want to set the range of our max or our min to a certain amount. So let's say if I hit too big, right? I want the number that I guessed to be the max number, right? So let's say I guess 42 and 42 is too big. Well, obviously our number is going to be under 42, right? So let's say I guess 30 in the beginning, right? And then I guess 42 afterwards, which is not that good of a guessing strategy, but let's say I did that, right? It will say that it's too large, then that means that's our cap. So it's gonna be between 30 and 42. If 30 is too small and 42 is too big, then it has to be in between. So we're gonna cap our thing at set max to our guess number, it's, it's, that, it's that simple when it's too big said max to guess mode. and then from there we just want we want our computer to guess and then we do the same thing for the other two well just it's just it's just too small right because when it's just right then that program ends and so I guess your number that's it here we have to change it to min, obviously, don't forget. Alright, now that we're almost done, all we have to do is, is put our max min inside our computer guessing game. So we just stick it in right here. Booyah. Now, let's play our program. Let's make this a bit bigger. The min is 1. What max limit would you like? Okay, let's say... I don't know, let's hit 30. Alright, I'll guess your secret number. Well, let's say my number is 23. Is my number 16? Uh, that number is too small. My number 23, just right. Booyah. 
That's it. Two guesses. That's all they really want to do for lab one. Right? Page one. And so uh, now we will be moving on to search algorithms and efficiency. And this is going to be a little more challenging, but it's the same concept that from before. All right, well, we know it's the same concept from before, right? So in the very beginning, it wants us to find how many five letter words are in the 10,000 words list, right? And, and that's pretty easy. We just use the computation time of block, right? But originally, it's not that clear what exactly you have to do, right? So first, let's load up the starter project. And we got all of this fun stuff here. So really, all we need to do is we take the 10,000 words list list it's list and when you click on it, it reports a list of 10,000 words very nice right and we'll use this function which we've covered before basically it checks if a list has uh, how many whoever letters right because if five letters it will check if this list has five letters right uh, word sorry it will check if a word has five letters or not right? but we will use it to check how many words in 10,000 have five letters right to do that, we first need to use the keep item. Uh, keep items from uh, function, which is right here. So keep items, basically what it does is it outlines the words that have five letters. That's what we'll be using. And it will put it in a separate list, right? So it will, it will keep the items from the main list. It will keep the, those items and it will post that new list out basically right so oops, see as you can see this the symbols right here they match right and you could say does uh, this is left blank have five letters right from the list of 10,000 words right so this is going to tell us all of the words that have five letters right one two three four five as you can see going all the way down very nice right it's that simple really now we want to actually know how long it will take to compute to compute this right now it's asking us for simply how many five letter words are in 10,000 words list right so we want to know just the number we don't want to know the actual words right we want to know the number so to find the number, we just find the length of this list because, you know, one, two, three, four, Z. So we find the number is 1,409, right? So to do that, we simply use the length of list. So length of this, boom, that's it. It's that, it's that simple, right? And now we just put this function into computation time and it'll tell us 60, 52, 46, right? It's going to be different every time because it's an approximation and sometimes it'll take longer for your computer to do it other times shorter right if you have a if the better your computer the lower that number will be and the less processes you have running on your computer the lower it will be now before doing this is actually really low for me and now because i'm recording it actually spiked up a bit which is kind of interesting but overall it's still in the low 40s and essentially what's going on here is we're keeping these items from the main list and each has five letters and we're measuring the length of that and we're computing how long this entire operation takes that's that's literally what we're doing uh and uh, we let's try 10,000 100,000 words right and you'll see it's gonna take approximately 10 times as much time right because the words list is 10 times longer and we're doing a linear search meaning we're going one by one by one by one right we're checking each word in every list one by one that's what we're doing uh, uh, each word in every single item of the list one by one now what we're going to do right is we're going to count right let's say let's say we change this to seven letters right make a prediction what do you think will happen do you think it's going to be more time less time or the same time right and the previous time was roughly 400 something milliseconds so, so as you can see right when you click on this it's the exact same time word length doesn't matter if I make this three doesn't matter two doesn't matter right it's going to be the same right 
It's the size of the list that we're working with, not the actual word length, right? If I made it a thousand, that's when the time changes, right? But if I made it 10,000, right, that's when the time changes. But if I made, let's say, five letters, it's still going to be the same. So let's say 10 letters, right? It's going to be the same every single time because you're going one by one by one by one, right? You're not eliminating anything. You're literally going one by one. It's going to take the same amount of time to run through that list regardless of what you're looking for, right? Okay. Uh, so as you as I just said, right, these are called linear searches or sequential algorithms is the fancy name for it because we just check each element of the list one by one in order. Just like we did with the number guessing game, right? A binary search is the best kind of search if working with really long lists or dictionaries. So the binary search is what we did because, you know, we eliminated a half. We we're like, uh, okay, one, two, sixty, pick halfway. We're going to eliminate this half. Then we're going to pick another half, eliminate that half and so on until we get to the number. And you see, you see the elimination by two every single time is a much, much quicker way of doing it. Right. Remember though, a list for a binary search has to be sorted right because you can't eliminate half of everything if your list isn't sorted then you're just playing by chance okay maybe the computer will find it if it's lucky but it's just chance right you have to sort a binary list you don't need to sort a, a sequential or linear search list right you don't need to sort it because you're just going one by one doesn't matter however it's sorted but for binary you have to sort it so just remember that they will test you that on the ap all right, so let's go over to the BHC website now. Let's go over, so we were on page, we got it to page three. Now we're just gonna analyze this binary search, right? And if you, if you can see, if you already see it, it's literally the exact same thing that we did on page one. All right, oh, I did not know that if you hovered over it, it actually, wow, okay, that's cool. But it's really binary search for value and data, right? Basically, this is where you put it in, Put in the data here you put in the value right script variables set low the low point of the list to one set high is the length of data right min max you guys recognize that min max repeat until the low is greater than the high repeat until the min is greater than the max okay right and it sets the current index to the average of the low and high right it finds the middle word current index right mine's the middle word then it says the current item to the item of the current index in the data, right? Essentially, the current item is the item of, of the middle item, basically. If the current item is equal to that value, right, then it will port true and it will continue looping. Otherwise, if the current item is greater than that value, it's going to half eliminate half the list by setting high to the current index minus one, right? And low to current index plus one. Basically eliminate half the list. Now, don't worry, you will not be making something this complicated, right? Even though essentially it's exactly the same thing that we did combined into one function, right? We did with those broadcasts and whatever, this is exactly the same thing, right? Just combined into one function. And it, uh, th I mean, that's really it here. Uh, you'll be asked two questions right here, which you can do on your own. And yeah, I mean, okay, well, let's go back to uh, by using some binary searches, right? So let's do both a linear and binary search and compare to time, right? For the word separate. So we have binary and linear search for the word separate. Now, obviously it has to be a sorted list, right? So let's do hundred thousand words, right? Now, it does not matter, right, for a separate, uh, to find separate in a linear search. It doesn't matter, right? It does not matter, right? It does not matter because it's sorted in a linear search can work with sorted and unsorted data. However, it does most definitely matter for binary search, right? So let's do compute the time of a linear search for separate in a hundred thousand word sorted list. Let's check that out. 322 milliseconds. Okay, not bad. I mean, it's very fast, obviously, because it's a computer. It would be a problem if it took a lot of time, right? But, and let's look at binary search. That's it. Two milliseconds. Three milliseconds. One, 
one millisecond, zero, one, basically instantaneous. Essentially, it's instantaneous compared to this, 324. Now, yeah, I mean, to me and you, right, okay, we can still do a linear search. It's just going to take longer. Correct. But let's say you're doing millions and millions of processes like these at the same time, right? And let's say you're like, for example, you're in the Amazon service or you're in like Google service, right? And you have millions of people buying things at the same time. You cannot afford to do a linear search for items. You have to do a binary search, right? Because if you do a linear search, you're just wasting money and you're wasting time, right? All right. Uh, I, for, I know that for the next page of the lab, they cover how long it takes your algorithm to find the word zebra and so forth. And I mean, that's pretty much self-explanatory, right? We just did this. So let's move on to the actual, the cool stuff. And it's the um, computation time of of sorting and of the integers and the Pascal's triangle right here. All right, because we just did linear and binary. So let's do, so let's work with sort this and these two. All right, so let's do sort first. Sort basically sorts a list of 100 words, right? Right, so this is the word before, and this is the words after. Alphabetically, obviously, right? So, so let's compute how long it will take to sort 10 words. Okay, that's pretty quick. 100 words, 33. Now, as you can see, that is a quadratic kind of um, scalage, right? Because you start with 10 items, and it takes you one second, and then you start with 100, and it takes you 39, 34. It is not linear. It's not 10 times greater because of the 10 times of the words. It is quadratic, right? Okay, pretty much simple. Let's try this. 25,000 integers starting from, let's say we start from 100. This will take you two milliseconds. Okay, because it's just instantly printing all of those numbers. Let's say from 1,000. Two. Oh, okay. As you can see, it's going to be the same for each time. And I mean, it's pretty self-explanatory why that that is, right? It's a constant regardless because it's just printing all the numbers from that, from a certain number. It's the same amount of integers from that number. It's not like you're changing the integers, you're just changing your starting point. That's why, right? And now let's go back to our Pascal string. So Pascal string, I'm not gonna go into it, but as you know, right? Um, Let's say we started with row three and we want to know what's in the second position, right? It's going to be two, but how long will it take to compute that? Zero second. Now let's say it's row 10, position four. Eight, right? A little, two, oh, two. Okay, two, that was an outlier, right? But let's say nine. Yeah, right? Let's say we do row 30 in position three, four, 70, 64. You can see it's changing a lot. It It, it is not... Uh, exactly linear and it's not quadratic right and as you may know by now right oh you see how long it's gonna take it's like 2,000 milliseconds but it's two whole seconds right which is a lot in computer time as you can see it's exponential right there's an exponent like uh, there's an exponent right and it's being raised to certain exponent and it's just continuing that way um, you if, if you really want to be uh, mathematical here you can do the same row uh, you can do different rows same position or whatever right and you can check you can literally graph an equation of how long it will take your computer on average to calculate that but you don't have to right? that's just if you're interested now right before we will be diving into removing things from a list and, and such and whatever right let's quickly talk about parallelism so in the previous lab right Parallelism is very simple. It's basically you have computers doing things at the same time. Let's say you have five computers and they're all doing different tasks at the same time in order to complete one main task, right? Well, we did that here. As you can see, you go to too small when I click broadcast, when I click broadcast, and too big when I click broadcast, right? This is all working at the same time, right? Because we, we didn't do this all in one sprite because it's gonna take a lot longer. We all did this at the same time. So if you could imagine each of these sprites is a different computer, this is a very primitive example of parallelism. Parallelism, however, is an amazing way to solve very big, complicated, and time-consuming problems with a bunch of computers in a quick way. Because imagine you had one computer solving one big problem. If you had one sprite doing all of this, it's going to take way long to do everything. Right? But let's say you had five sprites 
I love for four sprites doing this much quicker. It's almost instantaneous, right? And basically, that's just an, that's just the example of parallelism that they want you to know. And so now we will be diving into page six of Unit Five Lab One. Oh, sorry, page seven of Unit Five Lab One. All right, so now we're doing page seven and Unit Five Lab One. So the very first thing we want to do is we want to uh, experiment with the all but first of the list um, reporter, right? And let's say we do it with 10 words, All right? We'll say, let's say, what, what is this going to do? Well, as you may predict, it's going to remove the very first item in the list and it will report everything, every other, uh, every item left over. So the other nine items will be reported. So items two through 10 will be reported and one will not be. So as you can see, right, one through nine reported. Remember that the numbers in the list are still going down one by one, one, two, three, five, blah, 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 right? But there's one less item in the list and that's every item is shifted down one. Sorry, or up one, whatever, right? Okay, this is going to be useful in creating our heuristic design, right? So the first thing we wanna do, let's make a list for grocery list, right? All right, so let's say we have apples, right? Apples, if I can type properly. Apples, what is it? bananas, what else? Carrots, celery, the yogurt again. And let's say bananas just so that we can remove this later on, right? So we wanna make a predicate. And it's going to say, are the items of this list distinct? Meaning, are they unique? Are there, is every single item in this list unique? Or is there an item that already exists? Right? Now, you can do this with a non-heuristic kind of model. And what does heuristic mean? Heuristic means that we will be using our function inside of itself. Now, that sounds complicated. And it is complicated. I'll give you that. But we can do it. All right, so um, I will clarify this in the video beforehand if I haven't already, but I meant recursive, not heuristic. Heuristic is another problem solving technique where you get an approximation to the pro actual answer, not the definite answer. Recursive is when the program be uses itself. Our program will be recursive. So let's begin with that, right? And today in this video, I will just be covering are the items of this data distinct using recursive uh, imaging because be, be problem solving because of that like I mean you can use recursive method for determining like deleting um, items from a list but we already did that a few videos ago so I don't there is no really no point in doing it again in a recursive manner however we can do this in a recursive manner when talking about are the items of a data set distinct or not using predicate. So that, so enough talk, let's begin, right? So first what we wanna do is let's make a block and this block is gonna be a predicate, right? Let's, let's call, uh, I don't want it to be gray, so let's make it like orange. Let's say the name of this block are, is, are the, the items of, just are the items of, right? Cause our, our list is going to be our input, let's say data, right? List and distinct perfect now first if you copying the bjc curriculum right the first thing they want us to do is they want us to get three sorry not three two if statements hook them on and then they want us to get the is data empty and they want us to get all but first of contains and uh, duplicate the reports. All right, so far so good, right? This is kind of what they uh, gave us in the beginning, right? This is kind of what they gave gave us in the beginning. Uh, what do, we, do we use this? Yes, we do, but this is later, right? So we're gonna put data. So if the data is empty, if the 
whatever if all but first of data contains thing right in the actual thing it's blank report report okay now from here you'd be like I have no idea what's going on and honestly when I first did this a while ago I did too but let's break it down slowly right let's break it down slowly. let's break down if statement by statement so in the first if statement right is the data empty right if the data is empty what do we report well since this is a predicate we want to report a yes or no statement correct we want to report a true or false so we simply report true if the data is empty right if 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 the data is empty true is reported this means that the items of the data set are distinct right now it's not false because that would mean that the items of the data set are not distinct and you'll see later on it'll make more sense later on however right what do we put in here in this little blank well in a little blank they don't tell you but what we put in reality was item one of data now what this means it's basically saying that if everything except the first item has the first item right what will we do right well the second we know that if every if the first item of the data is equal is in the rest of the data that means that they're not distinct and we know that it's false automatically right however if this is not true if this is not true if the data is full or there's still data left and if this is not true then what what will happen here well right this is where we use a recursive function and we use our recursive function by calling ourselves in it now we cannot do this this will not work this will loop infinitely and nothing will happen and your snap will break right however we can use this now this is what we can do now this is how our final program will test if a data set is if the items in a data set are repeating or not right and it's it's simpler than it looks let's break it down one by one and then let's test it first off it's gonna say is the data set empty if the data set is empty if this is true it'll report true you're done let's say the data set you have you have five words in the data set it's not empty okay move on if the first word of the data right is in uh, sorry if if the first item of the list right is in the rest of the list excluding the first item so obviously it will be if it's in the first but if it's in the rest of the list excluding the first item right then it is an obvious false right it is an obvious false however right this is where we are brought if this is not true and this is not true this is where we're brought to the last last report and in the last report right obviously if i said true or false they would end and we wouldn't know right because you know we don't know we would just check the first we need to check the rest however this is where the program is recursive right and this program will use itself except not the first item of the list right it will not use the first item of the list and because of that it will loop it again excluding the first item of the list right but it's going to be a new list it's going to be this new data set without the first list and it's going to loop back and it's going to loop back and then it's going to loop back and then it's going to loop back until this data set is empty and then it'll report true if yes or it'll report false if no now recursive this is not an easy function to build this is very actually very complicated an advanced function to build right but it, this is how a recursive function works. Now, recursive function, they do save you a lot of time, right? As you know from the making lists video, um, if you want to make an actual uh, a function that appends, that appends and changes your list, it's going to take some more time. So please refer to that video if you want to make some kind of function that changes duplicates in the list, right? This is as far as we're going to go today. And so let's let's actually test this function because we still haven't done that right so we go to our the items of let's say this list right are they distinct false they're not because bananas repeats twice okay let's remove bananas 
True. Oh, they do. All right. Well, let's add a salary. False. So as you can see, our program works as needed be. And now we can use this uh, wherever needed. And I mean, that pretty much ends off our video today. Thank you for watching. I hope we helped. I hope the resolution and the audio is better in this video. I know we had some problems with the previous videos with the resolution audio. I hope this is easier for you to see and follow along. Uh, if you guys still care to watch our videos and want support, then we will continue. Otherwise, we will be closing off the rest of the year. Thank you for watching. Bye-bye.